Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Gave me a little bit time to uh, to still enjoy while I'm still alive. And, uh, <laughs> Thank you, Cyrus, for your uh, kind introduction. I, I believe the way you explained it was more the, it was more the other way around, but um, it was a nice time and it was a nice way to do service. And uh, for us, it was I don't know for you, but for me, it was uh, the beginning of a whole new phase. And uh, I like to thank the convention committee. And I, I'm, I'm just looking at you, you guys, but I'm not sure if there are perhaps other people present. I like to thank you very much for the invitation, also your own. And uh, I consider it a great honor. And um, I am not a um, I am not a experienced uh, convention speaker. I'm not. I'm not a speaker. I'm uh, I'm a sober member of Alcoholics Anonymous. And every once in a while, in my hometown in Amsterdam, I get invited to be the speaker for the speakers meeting in uh, on Sunday in the afternoon. And uh, I always like to do that. I'm always uh, also very uh, very nervous about it. But uh, it gets better over the years. And um, being a speaker is a little bit like drinking. If you, when you haven't done it for a while, you think, "Well, I kind of miss it. I kind of, I think it would be nice to be a speaker for another time." <laughs> and then you're standing there and you think, "Oh my God, how did I get myself in this mess again? <laughs> I should have, I should have known better." <laughs> my name is Ari. I'm an alcoholic. Yeah. And, um, I'm very grateful to be sober today. I'm very grateful to be at this convention and. Um, um, I came to uh, AA on the 4th of August 1989, and um, for me, um, that was a very bad day. And um, in retrospect, it turned out to be a very good day, but I didn't know that at the time. And um, I didn't come to AA because I was um, hoping for a solution. I didn't think, um, I, I think, I, I thought, uh, I was convinced that I had gone too far and uh, that I was beyond um, uh, beyond hope. And what uh, added to that conviction, um, what was a, a substantial part of that, perhaps all, I don't know, was that um, I had been trying uh, since I was I was 40 then at the time, or 39, I was nearing, I, uh, my birthday was a few weeks later. Um, I was 39, I was uh, getting close to 40, and um, from the time that I was 25, I, um, um, uh, which was the first time that I realized that I had some sort of problem, although at that time I didn't recognize it as being alcoholic. Um, but that was the first time that I started uh, uh, looking for uh, for help with my problems. And um, in the 15 years uh, between when I was 25 and when I was 39, 40, whatever, um, uh, I tried uh, about everything gradually and slowly over time. I tried about everything that the Netherlands has to offer uh, with respect to, um, let's say, cure or treatment uh, or, uh, yeah, for alcoholism. And um, I can't say that I tried AA, but I had been to AA in those years. And um, we have in Amsterdam, and I'm not sure how it is in the rest of the Netherlands, but in Amsterdam we have an institution, it's called the Jelinek. And for anyone with an alcoholic problem, the Jelinek is the place to go. That's where you at some point end up. They have detoxes, they have different types of treatment, and um, uh, from from they have a sort of different approaches, like they have a... a a light treatment, they have a medium treatment, they have a tough treatment, and they have the send away treatment. And um, my father, he was uh, very um, uh, well known in that circuit. In the time that uh, I was uh, like young, like uh, 20, 25, um, uh, the alcoholic scene of people seeking treatment uh, was a very small scene. It was uh, a very limited uh, number of people. And once you entered the Jelinek, you got to know all the people. And my father was very familiar there. My father was a very charming man. He was also an alcoholic, I guess. Um, uh, but he was completely different from me. He was like, uh, when he would come into a bar, everybody said, hi. I, he, his name was Ari too. But everybody said, hi. And he'd say, oh, you all take a drink. And everybody loved him. And all the women loved him, etc., etc. 
to a certain extent, because behind that, of course, there was the different, uh, the totally different alcoholic story, but that's something else. And he introduced me at some point to the Elinac when I went to him uh, with, um, uh, for the first time, the acknowledgement that um, I couldn't stop drinking. And uh, it wasn't that I came to him with, uh, with like, um, um, after a sort of conscious decision, um, I think I have an alcoholic problem, I, uh, I have to do something about it. It was not at all like that. What happened was that I had been drinking for about two or three weeks after my wife left me with the kids, and I had turned into a deep, 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 deep blackout. And uh, it, at the end of the blackout, what happened was that uh, I had a dog. Um, um, I was living in, uh, in, a, in, in, in an apartment building, big flat, like 11 stories in the Balmemere in Amsterdam. And uh, what happened at some point, because when I got into a blackout, it would usually, eventually, it would come to the point that I wouldn't walk the dog anymore. I'm just kind of a drunk. And um, uh, the dog, somehow, uh, I thought, would had, had ran off. And I felt so guilty about it that um, um, uh, that I started screaming and running around, and um, I felt so furious that uh, I, I had this big stick which I had left from the time that I traveled around India, and I went down to the you have a, a mailbox hall and it was all glass like in these modern uh, modern flat buildings, and with this stick I bashed all the windows in 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 this in this powerless anger um, uh, that was really enlightened by my fear and by my guilt and um, that's when I went to my father and he introduced me to the Yellinex circuit and um, that is where at some point um, um, the Yellinex circuit was it, it may seem a little bit of a complicated story and in a way it is but my point is that um, how did I get to AA um, the manager of the Yellinex was the man who met Bill W when he was in America setting up uh, AA and uh, that man, who was not an alcoholic, he brought uh, AA to the Netherlands. And he wrote a little pamphlet where he made his own interpretation of the 12 steps. And um, he believed in Alcoholics Anonymous. But they had different treatments in that uh, center. And um, But whenever an alcoholic would come to the treatment, he or she would be introduced to AA. And so was I. And um, uh, when I was first admitted there, I believe I was about 26 or 27, and um, in the evening uh, my father would come. I had had this, uh, this, this introduction to AA, and I had become furious. I had written the steps, and the idea that I would, I would need God to, to get rid of my problem was somehow so contrary to my... Yeah, my everything, my, my, my every, um, uh, everything that I thought I, would, I was about. I found it so humiliating, the suggestion only, that uh, I, I, I got into this blind rage, which uh, probably also was because I was very weak and I was on uh, Valium because they had this uh, tranquilizer treatment there. For three days they would really pump you up the tranquilizers to get the shakes a little bit away. And, uh, but I made a scene, I walked out, and in the evening my father came and uh, he brought me some, uh, some fish. And I said, Dad, what is this Alcoholics Anonymous about? I had never heard of it. I may have heard of it, but I had never given it a second thought. And he said, oh, my son, d d d don't worry about that. Alcoholics Anonymous is a bunch of cowards who are too scared to really drink. So what they do is they sit around and they talk about it. So that was my introduction to it. <laughs> <laughs> and I trusted my father and uh, I mean I trusted my father and I really clung to him because it was my first time in a treatment center and I felt very much like a kid I felt very much I was like 25, 26 but I was in, in bad withdrawal and I felt really shaking and like a kid because it wasn't that it wasn't just that I was feeling so sick but somehow I, I had crossed the line and the line was that, uh, because what with the dog and with the, 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 the flat uh, had happened before, I had had this wife for several years, and our marriage wasn't like uh, hunky-dory. It was based on, on the toad, but that's a different story, and it's, it's a little bit beside the point here. But as long as she was with me with the kids, I would eat. I wouldn't be drunk all day. I wouldn't drink all day. I would try to do the best I can, but um, but I, I I wouldn't drink all day. But the moment she left with the children, I can still remember very um, vividly this this feeling of relief. Of course, also of guilt and this and that and remorse and uh, it was all my fault because she didn't uh, leave uh, smiling. She left weeping, and uh, but I also felt this feeling of uh, of of relief and this idea that. Um, 
now I can go my own way. Now, now I don't have to. Um, uh, I don't have to um, uh, limit myself anymore. And the result was that within one or two weeks, I was in a very bad blackout because when I start drinking, I stop eating, and I just drink, 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 drink. And you know how it goes. And at some point, uh, you're so full of booze that that uh, something, the light goes out, and etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And that happened time after time. And um, when I was for the first time in the clinic. That is what I then had realized, and um, I went to that clinic many more times, or not many more times, but several more times, and I, I went into the Alinex circuit and I did everything uh, that could be done, and for a long time, um, for a long time, while I was trying to stop drinking, trying to control my drinking um, um, uh, their way, and they were very, very nice for me, and very friendly, and they gave me everything at my disposal which they had to offer. But things got worse and worse, and um, um, every time that I would be there, first I would feel very terrible, and after a while, and that is something that goes all through my drinking life uh, uh, until almost at the very end, what would happen that as soon as I felt a little bit better, also when I would be in a draw at home, I started feeling like some sort of a unaccepted hero. That my suffering and my failure and my etc. It was all part of a scheme. And the scheme was that in the end, I would be happy, I would be successful, and and I would be recognized, whether by people or by faith or by I don't know. But that was my dream, and that was what kept me going. And it kept me going for quite a while. And um, Although I had a very destructive way of drinking, I guess I was also quite, in a, in a way, sort of a, uh, well, maybe the dreams make you tough, I don't know, but I would go on and on and on, and sometimes uh, I would be at the academy, um, a social academy, because at some point I, I started thinking, well, maybe my problem is that I don't try to help people enough. So I go to the social academy and there I learn how to help people. And I really tried very hard to be a good person and I really felt very guilty about all the grief that I caused with all the people. Um, so I, I would try things and there I got this uh, this friend and uh, at some point uh, every once in a while she would see me in the morning walk in after, uh, after a bout or a spree or how we call it. And, and, and she'd say I, I'd be green or blue. And she just couldn't stand it, how I was suffering, and she couldn't understand why I was doing that to myself. And I tried to explain to her uh, a little bit what it was about, but I couldn't understand it either. What I did uh, realize was that I felt very powerless, but somehow I didn't know how to fit, fit that into the picture. And, um, well, to make a long story short, things got worse and worse and worse and worse. And uh, like with everyone, at some point, um, um, I guess, um, I really uh, got to the bottom. And um, we talk about the bottom quite often. My experience with the bottom was that there was no bottom. I just fell through and I just kept falling and falling. And uh, there was nothing there anymore. And um, I remember this one uh, one morning. I was living in those days. I was living in the neighborhood where I grew up, grew up as a little child. And when I was a little child, I always wanted to be a prince, and I wanted to be very special. And um, um, uh, in the neighborhood, I would I was always be a shy kid and, and, and scared and this and that and such and so. But I had these dreams, and uh, like every alcoholic, I guess I always had this idea that I was very special, but nobody did understand and that sort of thing. And um, but I had those dreams, and I kept those dreams. And um, Although many things happened that uh, uh, proved me contrary to what I wanted to be, it's, in some way I, I would still be able to uh, keep those dreams. And um, this one morning, um, um, it was, um, I don't know how long it was before I came to AA, but it was in like the last period where the light went out. What happened that I, I all night I did not have nothing to drink. And uh, so I needed badly to get some uh, booze in the morning, and um, I did have a little money. And all night I was counting my money to see if it was enough. It was all small change. And because I was very afraid in the morning not to be able um, um, to articulate myself, 
what I was doing all night was I was trying to walk around because I couldn't stand straight uh, 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 very well anymore. So I was walking around, I was counting my money and I was practicing. Heeft u misschien een flesje neven voor mij, Klarijn? So that is how I spent my night. And in the morning when the light went up and it was, it was uh, uh, in, I think it's springtime, it was a, a beautiful morning. And in the morning I went out of my house and I was very cold, so I had this winter coat on. I was of course not shaven and my uh, my, my underwear wasn't uh, really uh, up to standards. And um, I left my house to go to the shopping uh, street um, uh, that is about uh, 10, 15 minutes uh, away from my house. And um, while I was going there, I had to pass by a playground, a kindergarten playground, where I used to play as a child. And it was about a quarter to nine in the morning, so in this beautiful morning, everywhere the mothers were with their children by the hand, they were going to school. And you know how children are when they go to school in the morning, they're very excited. Oh, this and that, such a song, talking and this and that. And I was walking there, and I was feeling such a broken old man, and I felt so corrupt, so totally corrupt inside. And um, when I was about halfway, and the playground was there, so I was, all of a sudden, I couldn't go anymore, because I knew that when I would do one more pace, I would shit myself. So I stood there still, and I tried to control my uh, my system to prevent myself from shitting myself. And... Um, at that point, in a flash, all my dreams went through my system, and I felt so um, I felt so finished. And that's when I couldn't control my body functions anymore, so the whole thing uh, went running down my leg. And um, it's not very pretty, but it is what alcoholism was for me. And at that point, I said, oh, God, please give me a break. God, please give me a break. And then nothing happened, so um, I went on to the liquor store not smelling very freshly, I got my bottle, I went home, and that was the end of it, the way I uh, understood it, and I forgot about it, until this uh, one evening I called Alcoholics Anonymous, and um, the guy said, uh, do you still have any liquor in the house? And I said, yes, he said, throw it away, and I thought he must be crazy, and he said, you can come tomorrow at 12 o'clock, or 2 o'clock, I don't remember, so that's I went there. I had to call a, a neighbor girl, and because I was not familiar anymore, I couldn't get my mind together anymore on how to go there with trams or taxis. I, I just couldn't figure it out anymore. So I called this neighbor girl, a very friendly uh, uh, neighbor that I had had some contact with, with some people that lived there. They were students and living there, and I asked her if she could uh, call a cab in the morning and bring me to the, the, the place where I was supposed to be. I went there and I was invited and the guy, he read how it worked for me, etc., etc. And I remember sitting there all day and he went quite through some, uh, uh, some, some effort. And I remember sitting there all day and um, uh, listening to that and, uh, or afternoon. And I, I, I just felt like this man is so kind that he does all, the, all this trouble, that he goes through all this trouble for me, but can't he see that for me it is too late? And, um, well, then this young boy came in, and um, I think he was about 20 or whatever, and he was all fresh, and, you know, sometimes young people come into AA, it's, it's the most beautiful sight there is, and he came, and he came very proudly to me, and he stretched his hand out, he said, uh, I'm two weeks, and I said, good for you, good for you, and I meant that, and uh, I felt so old, so broken down, and... Um, in the evening there was a meeting and I was just sitting there and people uh, next to me, uh, this one guy, he was rolling my cigarette <laughs> and um, after the meeting was uh, in a break, this guy came to me and he looked me in the eye and he said, um, thank you for coming. And uh, I could see that he really meant it and, and that was very special for me. And uh, I've heard it uh, um, uh, told by more people, they had the same experience and um, of course, sometimes people say things that, um, you know, they try to be kind, but they don't really mean it. It doesn't mean much. It's just a social thing. But I could see in his eyes that um, that he meant it and that for him it was very special to see me. And somehow I could feel why that was, because I could understand that as I was standing there before him, I represented something that he was trying to get away from. And I realized that was the case for everybody in the room. 
a week later there was this convention and uh, it was at Thiel in the Netherlands and they said, Ari, you come with us to the convention. I said, well, uh, I was very scared. I was very afraid to do stuff. I was very, very ashamed and I was all the time thinking that people were thinking badly about me. And um, they said, Ari, you come. It's, it's good for you. It's, uh, if you want to stay sober, you have to do the stuff. And... Um, I said, well, all right. So I went there, and um, people were ever so nice to me. And there was like, like, like now tonight at Saturday night, there was this countdown. There was a speaker, and I remember um, seeing the speaker, and and I, I thought it was fantastic to be a speaker at the meeting of alcoholics, you know, because of you. <laughs> <laughs> a hero at last. <laughs> But the guy would make me laugh, and, and, and that was, I was all the time, I was so fixed on my own problems, and I was so fixed on, I wasn't so much fixed on my own problems, it wasn't that I had ten problems, my problem was that I felt so totally inferior, I felt so ashamed, that was my problem. And any given day that sometimes can still be my problem, and sometimes I think, what's the problem here? And all I, my only fear is, what will people think about me? But whatever. And um, at some point, because I was the guy there with uh, not the longest variety, <laughs> I, was, I was the newcomer. So they, they went to countdown, and, and, and I was all the time, I was counting how many days I was sober, and I said to this old timer at my table, I said, yeah, but I'm still using value. He said, this is about Alcoholics Anonymous. And it's okay, I want you to go up there. When they get to 24 hours, I want you to go up there. I didn't dare to go, but I wanted to go, and I, I went there. And I stood there, and there was all these spotlights, and it was fantastic. <laughs> I, I felt so, I felt so, finally, at last, recognition. Finally, they see who I am. I didn't feel like all like that. I felt, um, I don't know, it's, I, I, can, I can still see myself standing there. There was this uh, one guy standing next to me here. Jan, who I had been in the clinic with years before, and I found him in AA, and he at that point was sober about two years. And there was this other guy who was standing there, was also Dutch, and um, um, what happened was that people started applauding, and uh, I introduced myself, and I, I said, my name is Harry, and I'm an alcoholic and an addict, or whatever, because I didn't really know what I was, although, well, that's another story. But then I, I sort of went through my knees, and that was very important for me. The guys who stood next to me, they knew that was going to happen, or somehow they catch me. So they sort of kept me up. And um, that is how I started my uh, tour of success in Alcoholics Anonymous. And um, <laughs> what the hell that with my hand? Well, that. <laughs> what happened was people were so nice, and I, I, I. Of course, I've been in meetings, I try to share my story, and uh, I, I, I always try to speak the truth. Not only because this is Alcoholics Anonymous and here we just speak the truth, but also because uh, somehow I find it so important to find the truth about myself, because all my life I have been living this lie. All my life I have been trying to be somebody else, because who I was was just not good enough. Could never be good enough. And um, um, when I started sharing in AA, for a while I was very silent. I didn't dare to speak. And um, 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 at some point, um, 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 and of course there's a story there too, but um, then I get a little bit in the woods and that's always difficult. Anyway, um, um, I would share. At some point I decided that I would have to go to a meeting every day. So I did. And I would have to share every night. So I did. And um, that was very scary. What happened was when I started sharing about myself that whenever I would go home, I'd feel very uncomfortable. And uh, now, of course, it's very normal when you when you sort of uh, present yourself to your peers, like I'm doing here. It's very normal to feel uncomfortable. I didn't know that then. But I started thinking about it. Because when I was in AA, people would share and... Um, uh, we are very, very fortunate in the Netherlands that in Amsterdam there was also a lot of people from America and England and uh, where, where AA was, as AA was, made, was born, because AA has gone some different ways and sometimes you, you get to that type of AA. Oh, still sober alcoholics, but it's very different anyway. Um, um, people would say things like, um, you try to listen to the similarities rather than to listen to the differences. And um, 
I would try to share about myself and I would listen to myself afterwards and I would think about it, what did I say, and I wouldn't feel comfortable. And at some point what I started realizing was that I wasn't really sharing anything about myself. I was just making statements. And uh, my statements were still about, I'm strong, I'm tough, you don't touch me. And um, for me it took a long time to let go of that and still I have uh, I have a tendency um, whenever I am in, in, in a situation where I feel insecure, this is a situation where I feel insecure, um, um, I, I find it, um, I, I really have to, I really have to um, uh, uh, um, uh, give it some thought that I do not start to overshout myself that that in AA the truth is good enough. So I just have to share about myself and um, uh, that for me was a very important lesson and um, I was blessed with, with a fantastic sponsor and um, long before he became my official sponsor because I didn't dare to ask me because I, I you would always after the meeting say Ari you come with me I take you home or I take you halfway and you ride with me. And he would tell me his story, and um, it was just his story, but somehow I always had the feeling that he was not telling his story, but he wanted me to sort of do something. And um, like write bread lists and do this and do that, this, such and so. And it's not that I wasn't willing to do that, but somehow I felt very much overwhelmed by all this. And um, 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 But he was so important because he was a man who gave me some very practical handles. My problem was, especially in the beginning, that I couldn't do anything. I would just sit at home, I would just watch television, and, and I would just sit there paralyzed in the kitchen. There would be a, a pile of dishes, the house would be very, very dirty, and I just would feel guilty about it, but I wouldn't do anything about it. I, 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 would just, I, w I didn't have the strength or whatever. And um, um, he was a man who came with very practical uh, suggestions about that. And um, that's how I started learning to do small practical things, which um, are still things that uh, whenever the going gets rough, I still resort to small practical things. And I sort of try to get some tunnel vision and I try not to worry about the results, etc., etc., because... I, I can never get the results that I think I should get and um, I have to uh, exercise uh, little tricks to get around the, 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 the obstacles that I think are impossible to overcome. And he taught me small tricks and um, uh, those were the things that were told on the meetings by all the people who would come to AA and um, I was always listening. I was always listening very carefully and um, there had never been, ever since I came to AA, there had never been a doubt in my mind that I had a fatal problem and um, that if there would be anything in this world that could work, it would be Alcoholics Anonymous and, uh, um, and it did work and um, well, of course in the 16 years that I have now been sober, Many things happened, and um, I went through many crises, and somehow I all got through them. And um, for a long time, I thought that if I wasn't feeling good, I thought that I would be doing badly, because I could only the only connection for me was if I would be doing all right, I would be feeling good. But if I wouldn't be uh, feeling good, then there was something wrong, and. Um, uh, that very often put me on the wrong leg and um, at some point what happened was that um, things started to change for me in a sense that um, I started uh, I started to relax a little bit and I started to trust a little bit and I started to believe a little bit that this AA thing could work for me too and um, from then on life became different and I, 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 I'd say in sobriety I've had for about two and a half years I've had a pretty rough time. I, I, I never felt very good. I, I, I was always, like I said, always this shame, always this fear and coincidentally that probably has nothing to do with it. It was also two and a half years time that it took me to go all through the steps until I'm holding the fifth step. 
And after I had uh, done the fifth step, not just the dirty secrets, but like the whole thing with the grudge list and the fear list and all the relationship and sharing about that, which was a bit of an ordeal for my sponsor because he had to listen to all that. Um, then it was as if something fell uh, fell away from me. And um, I think that is when I started looking a little bit around and that, um, um, that I started believing um, a little bit that um, sobriety and life and perhaps even happiness might be a little something for me too. And um, my life in AA, for me, has always been special. I've always loved AA. From the moment I saw it, I've always loved it. I cannot say that um, life in AA on the ground in the daily nitty gritty is always a better process, but um, for me, AA was always very special. From the moment I started reading the book and uh, the big book and started thinking about it, I realized that it was really like gold and it was really something very special. And um, uh, I did quite a few things for the wrong reasons. Like I started doing service to stay away from the people. Because after the meeting, the people would come to me and they say, Ah, oh, Ari, how are you doing? Oh, you're doing very well. And, and I would feel very embarrassed with all that sort of attention. So what I started doing was I started picking up the ashtrays. And so I, I wouldn't have to uh, work with people. And um, because I felt so, um, uh, because I felt so um, terrible at home, I would try to be in AA as much as possible. Because what I um, uh, experienced was that whenever I was in AA, somehow I got a little bit distracted from my own feelings. <laughs> it's like they say, an alcoholic on his own is behind enemy lines. And uh, I found that somehow, in, when I was in a meeting or whatever, or with other AAs, that was uh, that was uh, taken away a little bit from me. Not not entirely, because I was I was always uncomfortable. And, uh, but so I, I went to as much as, as AA as I could. And the people who were so friendly for me, especially in the beginning, they were the people that ran intergroup in our neighborhood. So I went to intergroup. And also because the people all the time were saying such nice things to me, like, are you, are you doing great? And I really needed that very badly. So um, that is how I, um, I, I sort of accidentally ended up in uh, service work. And uh, like... Like, 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 like the other night in the meeting where, you know, you get these silences and you know these silences when we're looking for a treasure or a chair. We get these silences because we're all too shy to volunteer. And uh, I just couldn't stand the silence. So I'd go like this. And, and also with uh, the convention, uh, they, they, they were looking for a Mr. Fix. And uh, I, I said, is it, is it very difficult? He said, no, 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 it's a piece of cake. You can do it. <laughs> <laughs> it turned out that Mr. Fix had to do everything that the other people couldn't or wouldn't do. So I became Mr. Fix and I postponed and I procrastinated, etc., etc., until it drove me totally crazy. But in the meantime, I didn't drink. And um, over the time, while I was doing service for the wrong reasons and in the wrong way, and I was procrastinating and like the filing a literature report, I would, uh, for three months, I wouldn't do nothing. And uh, five minutes before the business meeting, I'd, I'd scribble my report, I'd run to the coffee shop, and I'd be sweating and cursing. And that is how I would go to, how I would go to the intergroup meeting. But nevertheless, I changed. And um, um, what happened uh, through all this surface work, I guess, and uh, because I was really trying very hard to do the things that needed to be done in order to stay sober, and I really tried to help other, other alcoholics, other people, I started slowly but surely feeling better about myself. And that is exactly what I was promised. My sponsor used to say if, uh, and that was because his sponsor said it to him and the sponsor before, etc., etc. It goes from generation to generation. What he says was that if across the street you see uh, an old lady falling and you see a man trying to help her up and you feel admiration for that man, then the next time you try to be there yourself. And he was quite tough on that. And uh, he was not a man who just walked the walk or talked the talk. He would also walk the talk, and um, he's still doing that today, and uh, I have great admiration for him, and without him it would have been quite different for me. The other day I was, uh, 
was having was having some some email exchange with uh, someone from our intergroup, and uh, it, it was about something I did uh, while I was uh, being the chair of the big book study in Amsterdam, and uh, we got to talk about that, and it's it's what I realized that. Um, Alcoholics Anonymous is for free. Sobriety is for free. There's no doubt about that. And there could never be a doubt about it. It, it. it could never be paid for. Whenever somebody walks through that door, he gets everything freely, unconditionally, no questions asked, at his disposal. But it is my experience that every generation has to deserve its own AA. And um, I, that somehow, if I look back over the years that uh, I've been sober in Amsterdam, and I mean, it's the best AA there is. It's, it's AA, no doubt about it. But we really have to build it up. And now it's my generation that has to build it up. The generation before built up its AA. Now we have to do our own AA. And it's not that it's a different AA, but somehow you have to own it. And I, I think that is where, that is where the, um, uh, it works if you work it, uh, comes in. And, um, I could never be standing here boasting about look me what I have done and look me what I have become because for me it was all really a free gift. I'm one of the lucky persons. Uh, for me everything that I have done and everything that I've been able to mean for people it just came to me. And of course there have been times that uh, you know how it is when you're watching a nice film on television and then somebody calls with a problem that you've heard before and uh, you have to switch off the television. It is so easy to say, look, you call me back in half an hour. So easy. And what's the big deal? It's only half an hour. But when the person's burning down, and for me, I had to be very rigorous in that. But like it is written, um, you have decided you want what we have and are willing to go to any length to get it. Then you are able to certain steps. And my first sponsor, he taught me that when we, see, when we say you have to be willing to go to any length, we don't mean like, well, any length. <laughs> That's only as a manner of speaking. <laughs> no, any length is any length. And I could understand that because um, I had suffered so much through my drinking, and not only through my drinking, but because of my whole personality, that I had suffered so much that, that I could easily understand that the solution for that problem could only be a very tough solution. And... Um, Living, living life in AA and with AA is sometimes a very, very tough thing to do. And, um, well, I think I've come a little bit to the end of my story. There is so much more to tell, but there's only so much more that you might be able to stand. <laughs> <laughs> It's, um, I don't know, it's so wonderful. I start now understanding myself a little bit more. And for me now, it is much more easy to see that the way I am pieced together, not through my fault, not through my parents' fault, it's, it's well, it's like a giraffe, a spots, I'm an alcoholic. But for me now, it's, uh, yeah, it's, it's not, it's not, not because, uh, it's not some, something, it's not punishment or whatever. It's just like you get a bad heart condition or whatever. You get an alcoholic. It's tough. But it's also tough to be born in Africa, in some slum. It's also tough. And, um, but, um, I can, uh, I can see now that, um, that, that the way I am pieced together, I could never have a chance. I have in my relationship with Charlotte, we have gone through um, through some rough times, and uh, of course there are there are different type of problems. But my main problem was that I could have these anger attacks, and that was very hard on her. And um, at some point for her, it was uh, so it became so unbearable that she said she had to say, "I I love you, but you have to do something about that because else." I need to leave you, I can't stand it anymore. And I was very frightened, but I, I did go to some place, I did see some people, and uh, I tried to really get to the bottom of it, and um, uh, and it worked. And it's not that my anger has gone now, but I have made some improvement, and um, uh, that, that was a relief, because it really broke my heart when I could see how much pain I could cause with that. And one thing I found, and it, that was, it, it's so easy once you figure it out, but it's so hard to do something about it, that at some point I can get very scared, and I can get very ashamed, 
and I don't dare to talk about what is the cause of it because I feel so ashamed and I sort of want to hide it. And uh, when you pressure me, pressure me, I get more in the corner, then all of a sudden I explode. And I didn't know that, but I discovered that. And also something else that I discovered not so long ago was that um, a lot of my anger is caused by some, 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 some deep-seated disappointment. When I was a child, I was already very disappointed. And alcohol somehow solved that. But like they say in AA, alcohol gave me wings to fly and then it took away the sky. And um, that's how it goes. <laughs> it, um, I'm very grateful that AA found me. I'm very grateful that I was sent to Alcoholics Anonymous. I didn't call him myself. I never took the decision to put the drink down. I have at some point, when I was a few years sober, I had to make the decision for myself that I had to go for it. That I, uh, if you get, you say, in, there's all sorts of phases in AA, and one of the phases is, of course, that you uh, at some point uh, start thinking like, uh, why do I have to do all the work? Why do they not do something for a change? <laughs> and um, it. Um, it I, 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 I had to come to terms with the fact that there were ordinary people in the rooms together with me and that AA is a very small village and that I have to live with you guys and I, I, I often find that very hard but I try to be honest about it and um, well I think this is about what I have to share I thank you very much for your attention it's, it's great that you have been listening and I hope uh, it, 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 for you it, it, it yeah, it means a little something for you. And, um, yeah, thank you very much. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.